Hello and welcome to another episode of Girl Boss Grindset, which may contain traces of board games. Uh, my name is Hannah and I am the Guildmaster of Guildmaster Games, um, making paperbook games and trying to help other folks to do so as well. Uh, and I am your co-host, Keith D. Franks. My job title is much less exciting than Guildmaster. I just make things. Um, but yeah, this is the Grindset, the world's most difficult to organize podcast apparently uh, no, um, it's, the grind. <laughs> it's the grind exactly and and this episode we wanted to talk about um gender and game design now for reference i know that people usually are like oh work shit whenever people talk about these kinds of things but to give you a frame of reference the breakdown of um the average person in our industry is so narrow it's like 90 percent male 90 percent white and then like 90 percent 35 to 50. so being um like young and not male is apparently a crazy outlier <laughs> right um i thought that would be something interesting for us to talk about um putting the girl in girl boss crime set um, did you want to kick us off with some some parts yeah, well, of how we got to here in this particular part yeah, of the conversation? Um, I actually thought it might be cool to um, just quickly like um, address because we've had some sort of feedback from the last episode. Oh yeah, you maybe want to yeah sort of like chat about that and then move into our other stories. Yeah, sure. And just, yeah, like I, I just like say thank you um, to all the folks that like commented and have talked to us about their experiences, and that sort of leads into into the the gender angle. But in general, in the industry, um, yeah, I think we came across in the previous episode as um, like demonizing maybe some people <laughs> like um, publishers and distributors and stuff, and I I think it was more talking about just the way things are set up and maybe not quite as um don't yeah don't feel quite as as vertically mobile as they could be and that's even for the sort of people that fit almost the exact um stereotypical demographic in it and so the folks that you know do have different genders and nationalities and sexualities and um identities can be even harder so um yeah i think uh i just want to say like Thank you to the folks that have chatted, and hopefully we can um, move forward. And, and in a future episode, I think, uh, yeah, do a bit of a recap and a reflection and, and talk about what we've been talking about. But, um, yeah, for sure. I think that would be something, uh, and it will feel like people are able to have more of an input in, in what we're talking about and what we're doing. But it also means that if like something's been misinterpreted or people are like, asking for clarification, then we can come back and cover some of those things. Yeah, and like all of my down. comments and replies always sound so scathing to me when I read it back, when I'm just like neutrally trying to explain things that might not have been taken at face value, or they've like just assumed that we're referring to literally every single publisher that exists. Like, no, there's just probably some shit ones that we've interacted yeah. with because <laughs> we noticed or something. I, uh, ah. yeah. No, but yeah, everyone from you know talk to us and please keep commenting and keep giving us your opinion because we love to hear it and we do want this to be as much a conversation as possible so um yeah and to move on to sort of the gender journey i suppose like uh yeah so i'm a trans woman and i have been for like o openly i suppose for about eight months or so so in terms of my own personal journey and experiences in the industry, um, and just in general in life, like um, it's a very brief amount of time that I've been, I guess, different from that norm. Because yeah, as a, a 31, 32 year old white man, I was absolutely square in that um, uh, majority demographic. The biggest um, slice of pie, yeah. But also yeah. you, you kind of. I don't know if came out is going to be the right word, but um, we noticed a change post COVID. And um, I found that actually I know a lot of other people that have come out of COVID and have transitioned. And it's like 
you were hidden away and unseen because you weren't going and doing things. Everything was kind of shut down. And then you come back and you're meeting people at these events again and you're suddenly realizing that there's so many people are actually completely different people. <laughs> yeah. I think, like, actually, that yeah, was a little bit COVID-related because with Half Monster, like the previous company I was working with, we had sort of investors who were absolutely, like, you know, all, like, white men in their, you know, 50s and 60s. So I wasn't quite sure at that point if being my true self mm. because it's been, like, a couple of years of feeling like I'm, I'm, um, like, realizing what all of these feelings were and, and why I was feeling so discordant with myself beyond just, like, anxiety and ADHD. You know. um, but, yeah, I felt like I had to present a persona and, like, really, um, like, I felt like it would have been a risk to the business for mm. me to be openly myself. I suppose, and so I kept that hidden away from my game design public life. I suppose, um, but yeah, as a as a trans woman, and I think so. I had a discussion. There's yesterday I did a build a board game workshop at a um, at a school here in Brisbane. Um, the kids that you know. Uh, need more support with their learning um, and behavioral um, sort of issues. And uh, it was great. It was a lot of fun. And we did a little kind of rainbow circle afterwards. They have a weekly group to just talk about those kind of issues. And um, one of the things they asked was, is, like, has life, how has life been different in terms of work? Um, since I've come out as trans and since I've been more openly presenting myself as a woman and um, like actually just living that life really authentically. And I think I, I struggle to answer that question because I think that I am, book and community in general is, in my experience, very like on face value, like accepting of mm -hmm. at the very least like trans. It's pretty people. regarded as being left leaning. Yeah, and um, I think there's there's always a lot of talk about sort of um, trying to open pathways and gates and build uh, more entry points and ease of access for um, like women and um, people of color and minorities and just sort of a whole range of people because there there is at least at the very least an acknowledgement within the community and within the industry that it is very um, as you know it's it's pretty lopsided in terms of the demographics that have traditionally engaged um, and that you see at these kind of conventions and things. So mm. I think without a person, like, I think we would love to be able to um, have someone or a variety of people to come on who are, um, you know, women and um, people of color and who have had these different experiences. But because I built my entire career, I guess, or the foundation for my career, um, as a white man, mm. it's, you know, it's, it, it feels sort of, um, tricky to really give that perspective yet. Okay. Um, and in some ways I feel that, um, I get, like opportunities partially based on um, the fact that I'm, I'm trans and I'm coming out and I'm trying to engage in the industry in that way, um, which is an interesting place to be, like coming from, from a position of such privilege in society at large. And then, you know, I, I, I'm still figuring it out. Like, I don't know if it's real or not, but... Um, potentially having opportunities based on on the emphasis in in the industry of trying to promote and support people okay that are can i can i hit you with a, a hard-hitting question along that line yeah, please. do you ever feel that people that you work with that knew you before that their relationship based with you is still based on that original image of you that they have in their head and that you have not changed as a person? 
like I think so in in a way, and like I have changed as a person like so much. Um, but in terms of how I approach business and how I approach tabletop design and like development and production and trying to support people to be able to make their own games and to to do what I guess like what we do, um, that approach hasn't necessarily changed. But yeah, like I think I've been lucky in that I developed. I was able to sort of fail and to iteratively develop the techniques that I use as both a designer and a um, producer and like a salesperson and stuff like that um, without extra barriers that may exist um, to folks that are trying to go through that process of learning um, that aren't white men. So, yeah, I mean, um, if I could ask you like in terms of your sort of gender identity and journey and things like that like how you know how comfortable do you feel engaging in the industry and uh, i think about it a lot um honestly yeah. so uh i'm in a really weird situation where my fan base is um really heavily skewed um lgbt now i released a game called winning love by daylight which is basically a lesbian romance story um and the fan base that i expected to get from this was again like the the super horny white male um core demographic of pretty much any of these kind of dating sim-esque games um yeah. and then all the people that were actually engaging with me were predominantly teenage girls from the united states and every single time every one of them was like this needs to be more gay i want to see more of these things in it um, and obviously, I ran in that direction as far as I could. And so I feel like the average person, when interacting with the end user of their product, like especially in board games, you're doing testing or you're playing, like running demos at conventions, you're seeing the same one type of person. And oftentimes, that same one type of person looks like me, right? Um, and so, even though I feel inside pretty feminine, uh, and I'll get to more about what i am later on but um mm. i still prevent like present incredibly white male um even though i don't feel like that's really who or what i am i recognize that and i try and use that as much to my ability as possible to like both use it as a camouflage for myself where i feel like i am in these spaces that are catered or like catered specifically to that type of person but are all exclusively um tend to deny other types of people and I can be in there and I can be that voice to be like, hey, actually, some of this shit is not okay, um, which I try and do a lot. Um, even if it's just like making someone reconsider about something like one time, then it kind of feels worthwhile. Um, yeah. So I do kind of understand that with great advantage comes some of this responsibility that I, I should be trying to use to make things better for other people. Um, but then like for me in particular, uh, I'm non-binary. That's kind of what I've got written down there. My my they them. So I really don't give a shit about what pronouns people use to refer to me because I don't have much of a, a sense of self-image. So like when people are like, "Oh, you have to be masculine or feminine," I really don't give a shit. Um, right now, recording this podcast, looking at myself on the camera is about the maximum amount I'll ever perceive myself in my day-to-day -day life. I wear my pajamas all day. I <laughs> just like. Like I record another podcast with my roommate. I'm literally in my pajamas. I don't even have a monitor for looking back at what we're doing. So I'm just like looking at my roommate while we're talking about like Pokemon yeah. or games or whatever, right? That would be the folk narrative, like in yeah, the about storytelling. Definitely um, check that. Yeah, I'll, I'll sneakily, you know, shameless yeah, plug. Am I right? Cool. Um, but then, like ordinarily, I don't. I don't feel particularly masculine. Uh, in fact, I. I find it a lot of comedy is derived from the rejection of masculinity because it's such an ingrained thing that you have to be this big, strong creature that is scary to anyone that might threaten you and all these kind of things. I'm paper thin. <laughs> like, I've never been some strong, dangerous creature or whatever. Um, and instead, I've been more interested in telling the kind of stories where people help each other and people learn about each other and go through their own journey and stuff like that. So... I don't know. I think it's it's really tough to 
go through that journey on your own and discover who you are and mm. either go, oh, this is something I want to change or I am actually happy with how things are. Because I, I make a lot of jokes about being an egg, um, which is, uh, for those of you that don't know, is a person that hasn't come out as trans yet. And because I have a lot of feminine parts to my personality that I'm really, like, really proud mm. of, uh, I make jokes about, like, as if, why wouldn't you just take pills to become sexy? There's, like, no downside. <laughs> like, and stuff like this. So I get accused of being an egg a lot, and I'm fine with that, right? Um, but because I don't care what I look like, I there's no incentive for me to change or look or be any different. But then I'm also conscious I have the upside of looking like this gives me certain advantages. But then I also get to see a lot of people like Hannah where I'm worried that if the way that you present or the way that you look means that you're going to have negative interactions with people in the industry or the general customer, then that's going to suck. Like, And I don't know. I, that, I It's kind of one of the big reasons why I wanted to do the podcast. So we can kind of talk about these kinds of things because there isn't that many voices that do these kinds of conversations, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're on... I don't know about you, but like I've, well, yeah, I'd like to know, but um, I have a really supportive, like my my academic work, like it's a very supportive community, and they have like a whole equity department that um, promotes acceptance and openness and um, provides those kind of safe spaces. Um, and in my friendship groups and relationships and my partners and things like that, like do you? Do you feel like you have that same non kind of game design opportunities to sort of experiment and see how you'd like to present or um not really i guess because i have um my own identity problems within my family for example Most, yeah. pretty much everyone in the industry knows me as keith um but for the first 18 years of my life i was dylan which is my middle name uh, and Keith is also my father's name, hence being Keith the Third. Um, but my mum changed my name um, to my middle name to be my first name, um, and I had a different last name. And for the first eighteen years of my life, right? Um, and so, in hitting eighteen, I changed my name, and a bunch of things happened there. The first thing was I could only change it to something it had been before, um, because my mum had changed it so many times to keep my uh, last name current. Which meant that I couldn't just have something ridiculous. I really wanted to be Spazzy McJazz hands at the time, um, and they wouldn't let me do that. So I had to go back to something that I had already. So I went to my birth name, which was Keith Dylan Franks. I know that's like a rule. That's not actually a rule. They just didn't want you to call yourself that. <laughs> they didn't know that. I hadn't put that forward at the time. They were just um, like, no, unless if you're getting married or, right. So Mrs. McJazz hands, if you're out there, I'm single. <laughs> Um, and the other thing was that mum didn't want me to change my name. She was very, very upset, uh, when I came to an, to get the, uh, I wanted to do it at 17 and I needed the Guardian Coast intro and then I ended up just doing it at 18 anyway on my own. Um, and I, I feel like give it enough time to think about it, I would have done something more neutral because my, my mum's surname is Carter and I could have been Keith Carter, which is like the coolest fucking detective name ever. Yeah. Um, but then now, cause I earned this new name, Keith Franks, becoming an adult, I now have an adult name and a child name, right? And anyone that knew me before I was 18 still calls me Dylan. So all of my parents still call me Dylan. Um, and this is like a really strange thing for me. It doesn't like, in my, um, interactions with them isn't super strange. Cause like my stepmom calling me Dylan, like she just yells out Keith into the house, a whole bunch of idiots are going to turn around. Like, so I, I, I understand stuff like that. Um, so it feels like it's a work persona. I put on my work persona and come to work in the board game industry as Keith. Right? Yeah, look, I think that's exactly <laughs> like, Yeah, for a couple of years. So. Yeah. So I don't know if, if there were like, I wanted to be like, hey, look, this is a new name or something that I want to try or I want to be this other kind of person. I don't feel like that's something... I felt I've missed out on if that's if you know what I mean. Uh, I don't know. Just put on my Keith tie, Keith shirt, go to work every day. 
Yeah. Um, it's interesting, like, it's, it's interesting that you've made a game that I suppose really focuses on those kind of issues and um, sort of providing a, um, a space and opportunity for that community to come together and, um, yeah, like, yell at you to make it more gay. Yeah. But, you know, also interact with each other, right, and be represented. Um, yeah, represented in a way that's not like, hey, I'm this thing. Yeah. Um, where their identity is core to the story told about them. It's like yeah. the... Uh, I want to get the quote correctly, but I remember there was a thing where it was like being trans was the least interesting thing about them. And it's like they're still a person, they have this whole identity about them, and they've ac accomplished all of these things, and then their gender is just what you're looking at. And that shouldn't be such a thing that you focus on and the whole conversation revolves around that. Because I understand it's relatively fresh in the cultural consciousness and people are still coming to terms with it existing as a concept, right? But it doesn't mean that... Like, for you, and I'm sure you probably have a similar experience to me, when I meet normies out on the street and they ask, what do you do for a living? And I say, oh, I make board games and video games. I'm suddenly the coolest person in the room, all right? Yeah. And how I look's got nothing to do with that. I'm I'm sure sure you probably have something similar, right? Yeah, I think I, I think potentially we're very lucky to be born in this day and age where, yeah, like the reaction is to not just go like, well, "What are you doing? Like, what is this? What are yeah. you?" Like, it's, it's not nice to ask those questions, you know, unless sort of prompted. So let's talk about what do you do? And, um, yeah, maybe it's just sort of like folks might just see that difference and go like, well, like you're sort of different from what we'd expect. Like how how does that work? Um, in terms of the industry that you're in and in your life. And so lots of successful board game designers that aren't trans, but there's not necessarily heaps and heaps that are promoted everywhere. <laughs> True. That are. Um I um have you found that, like, as you're thinking about gender and, and um, sexuality and that kind of thing, like, that it's influenced your game design? Because I've noticed, at least in my own games, the most two recent ones that I've made through Guildmaster, which is sort of Guildmaster and, and, and myself as, as Hannah and, like, my true self, have just mm. been simultaneous. So it's... um uh. I, I've noticed that I am not including like human characters in the games that I make lately because, yeah. and I don't know if that's just because I'm just interested in those mechanics or if maybe it's sort of, you know, one was about frogs and the next one was about conspiracies, which are very, you know, pretty genderless. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I'm like, yeah, if it's just a coincidence or if I'm like subconsciously sort of going like, because in Half Monster, with um, the most recent game I made there, which was Xeno Hunters, um, I very, it sort of just happened, but the four main characters in that game are women, mm. and they're all cybernetic women. And as I was showing off the game to people, it was like a much bigger deal than I thought it would be. Yeah. Um, and I have one distributor even just be like, hey, uh, you know, like, for us to sort of take on this game in a big way, I think you should change the box art and the characters to include men as well. Because I don't, and they thought that people wouldn't wow. buy the game. Yeah, and I was just kind of like, so yeah, it went from just being a coincidence to being something that was a very deliberate statement. Mm. Where I was like, well, there isn't any reason that it shouldn't be a bunch of like mercenary cyborg space women that are fighting aliens. Like, yeah, right. It's, why it's not? fantasy. Yeah, and um. I love you know, <laughs> to see if that would have an impact on whether um, right. Yeah, I have had something similar. So, uh, as you can see yeah. over my shoulder is Castles of Calera, um mm. a castle game, right? Uh, specifically yeah. devoid of, of humans um, in a lot of the art there. Um, after that, mm. I did Spirits of Carter Mansion, which is Rooms of a House. Um, but then I've also done um, a few other things that have got people in it. I do, I am mindful of making things relatively gender neutral, especially in writing. Um, very rarely do I want to use pronouns in writing just at all. So I try and phrase things and describe things in a way that 
um, is relatively neutral in such a way. Like I was working on a writing project where um, all of the characters in it are part of this insect colony. And gender is different because there's no um, like two sex reproduction, right? There's just the queen that lays eggs and then everyone else has their specific job there. Yeah. So in theory, your gender would be your job. Like your gender would be board game designer <laughs> or, you know, um, forager or diver or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, uh, in that, it was like you can't accidentally use the wrong pronouns for someone because there just is none. It would make no sense. So just literally everything had to be um, neutral. And I don't know, it was tough like when you start doing it like that and it's very intentional and it's like you control f for like he him shit and you're like fuck i've uh, accidentally done this because i'm autopiloting writing through this thing and you realize how difficult it is actually to get rid of some of those ingrained behaviors um, and i'm sure people have that in regular conversation and stuff like that and it you, you can mess up and it can happen all the time and it's difficult but also like training regular habits for things that make that easier like just using someone's name or not referring to people at all it's pretty common for australians to just not refer to people um, with pronouns yeah. or with names or anything at all or would just use nicknames or um swears <laughs> <laughs> often the right approach necessarily it's like, a middle ground it's not so awful it's a, it's <laughs> sort of almost erasing gender and, and trying to avoid dealing with it in a way. Mm. But, um, and I think that's pretty easily like justifiable, but I guess maybe maybe it's worth thinking about like, is that what we should be doing? Or yeah. should we be trying to represent more people in different ways? And like if it really doesn't matter if they have gender or not, then maybe we should just put it in and, and, and have a range. Um, I'm about to, the next game I sort of want to make is called Desolation Jupiter, um, which is about going like you're on a sleep on sleeper ships mm. um, and you arrive at Jupiter like colonies, but because it's taking you like 80, 80 years or whatever, because you've got the cheap option in cryo, you get there and the whole place is just like post apocalyptic, like desolated and ruined and you have to try and do that but um it was really interesting because i talked with my partner um emma about it and um your family is like your character okay. and like one of the twists in the story is that they're also your health points in a way so okay um you know you might have like a random family friend or whatever um but also like there are like kids and adults and and moms and dads and like you just get a random family you're trying to um it's like a mix of alien and uh like lost in space okay yeah which i thought was an interesting thing um and babies are essentially items that pick up an inventory slot and come to <laughs> checks like, out you don't want to just you know, you're like oh cool a gun yeah. yeah um but yeah she was talking to me about like because i have stuff like mom and dad sister brother you know just trying to talk about the relationships between people you know, is would there be a capacity to include some other considerations there? Um, and initially, my initial reaction was kind of like, oh, like, I don't think that's necessary. You know, like, it's, it's not about that. It's not about this. Yeah. But, is this a battle I want to have to fight? <laughs> that was the thing. Yeah. It wasn't all of my arguments were sort of more about like, oh, it like, doesn't really fit the concept and that's what going for but actually on reflection internally it's because i didn't want to try and think about it too hard or deal with it. the idea mm. of um how could i make these some of these characters like trans or non-binary or you know yeah you know and like why not like and is it something that i should do in just the art or is it something that i should have on the cards and so like the game is partially i'm trying to prompt thoughts about like the values that people have and like mm. you know should we try and save the most useful person and chuck this baby out because you know like or like is is someone who's like an elder compared to like that has like more experience or is maybe not as like fast or has as many health points is that worth as much as someone who yeah is like a teen and is really quick and stuff so um 
yeah, like it would be an interesting wrinkle in the mechanic where a lot of the, some of these characters are. That's just another part of the the details of the character. Um, because yeah, then I'm also I'm not sure if I want to do that. You know? like, yeah, because there is that struggle in in balancing it. Yeah, but like also have to learn is based on on gender identity as well. Mm. It's like, is that useful or helpful, or is it just? But I mean, age is in there. Age, mm. the family role, family dynamics. You know, so why not? Yeah, I um, I guess. Yeah, I've had mm. um a similar conversation to this um with a trans woman friend of mine, because oh, originally okay. my stance was that gender is a bullshit social construct, and everything yeah. could be neutral and that would be easier. But coming from me as a non-binary person, that's obviously the point of view that specifically services me the mm. best. <laughs> All right. Um. <laughs> Yeah, and and I I say this to her right, and she goes, "I fought very hard to be this. I don't want everyone to be nothing. I specifically wanted to be this." And I'm like, "Okay, that is yeah. kind of fair." <laughs> I guess in a way, like specifically, she, they were that, and it was very hard to fight to be able to use that moniker. And... Yeah. There's a balance in people saying, well, it's not even something that we want to acknowledge or, yeah, yeah, I think it's complicated. I think it's, um, yeah, I, I think it's one of those things where it would be great to, you know, especially for, you know, I suppose to, to talk with more people and get more perspectives and, um, to invite folks i guess to chat about it mm. um, i know my discord there's um yeah there's the i feel really lucky there's um some very active um trans and non-binary people maybe we could do like a like a round table <laughs> that'd be cool or like a, a viewer call-in kind of thing yeah um and for everyone watching like if you're interested or you know someone or you know just like to weigh in like please comment or let us know if you'd like to be on something like that so um, and then the, yeah, Eris, I think, in, in their comments was like, you know, if you guys want me on, mm. Yeah, that, that was really funny to me. So Eris posted this com um, comment on the video, mm. but the name of the account or whatever wasn't super obvious who it was. And then I get a message in my inbox, which is like, hey, just letting you know that comment's me. <laughs> which I, I thought was really funny. Interesting. So, yeah. like, just in case there's any, you know, misinterpretation as to who or where the comment was coming from, you know. Um, so, I, I understand that definitely some of the discourse on the internet with yeah. added anonymity, like, makes it complicated to understand someone's perspective because you don't have context on who's saying it. Uh, and it's really easy to take things more negatively than they are. It's interesting. Um, one thing that we said last episode, which I thought might be fun to do, mm. is how it's like these things that we're talking about, or why don't we talk about through the lens of trying to design a game about it? Yeah. So, so how do we design a game that encourages very specific use of the many underrepresented yeah. genders that we have? Use of gender. Like, mm. I don't know if I've seen a game that is specifically about gender and there being mechanics around it, even. I think. Mm. Um, I think it's pretty easy for it to slide into like comparison and competitiveness and um, you know uh, yeah competitive play but maybe there's like I, I think from foundation if we're talking about designing a game in terms of main concepts maybe um, some way to be collaborative would be great and mm -hmm. even if um, yeah like gender for individual players Within the context of the game changes over the course of the game, you know, that can be something that's... There's a few games that exist already. Yeah. Like, for example, Munchkin yeah. Um, yeah. has something that lets you flip your, agen your agenda to the opposite yeah. one because um, mm. they have specific items. I think I think the, the point behind it is that they have items that are specific to specific genders. Yeah. 
Um, but then like you also have stuff like South Park, which has a difficulty meter, which is just how dark the color of your skin is. So there's definitely people thinking about these things and attempting to use them in a way <laughs> that, right, that yeah. conveys the differences between different types of people. I don't I wouldn't say that it's always been done well, but it definitely makes a point when it does exist there. And these days, because the the conversation around gender is so volatile that it feels like unless if you've done research or you actually talk to people that don't look like yourself or have played games that have done good jobs or have done bad jobs and realize what you're trying to fix, it's going to be a difficult thing to do specifically. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's like, and also like, in the context of a tabletop game, there's always like a goal that people are working towards. Mm. So it doesn't be forever. Maybe it'd be good if it did go on forever, but like, what would be the goal of a game about that? Well, while you were describing your your family in mm. Desolation of Jupiter, um, I was starting to realize what kind of ways that you could break down a particular occupant of the ship. So mm. you could have a gender neutral character that is a parent, right, or a sibling or whatever. Like you're using that that neutral category descriptor yeah. of them, but then yeah. you use an additional descriptor to describe their role in it. So it could be parent, birth giver, right, which to a human goes, oh, that's a mother, but not necessarily anymore. And then hundreds of years in the future you could look like anything and then do any of the things that any human in particular could do through science in theory, right? So being super specific doesn't really help and being super vague doesn't really help. Being able to describe the specific things that are options makes sense. Yeah. Um, cause really what we have is a language problem, not a gender problem <laughs> these days. Yeah. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, like a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to refuse to refer to you using the specific pronouns that you've asked of me, or I'm going to refuse to learn any of the new discourse with what's happening. And it's like the respect that you give me is that you taking five seconds to actually understand or, you know what I mean? It's much less about it being like, in itself a huge problem because this is not something brand new. Mm. Um, hundreds of years old are these problems. I mean, yeah. just recently people are like, no, fuck, there's no way I'm going to use these words or refer to you with respect or all these kind of things. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, um, at, like, in movies and stuff, which are very, like, adjacent to games in terms of entertainment and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Whenever a big change like that is made, especially in the Marvel Universe at the moment, there's, like, such a huge aggressive pushback, um, language-wise, in yeah. kind of sort of tackle and, and broaden representation and stuff. I guess it does, but then, I mean, that's, you know, because the, the thing that the distributor, Xenon, said was, it's like, well, the target market isn't going to respond as well because it's not representing that market. Mm. With um, sales figures and stuff, like, there are time, yeah, there's a lot of really big major properties that have tried to tackle some of that into broaden perspectives, and it's not, and it's had like financially detrimental effect. Um, and yeah, like I'm, I'm just trying to think of like how if we were to make a game about this, like what's the wrong way to go about it? Like mm. what learn in terms of including or centering on gender um, that doesn't, yeah, that just includes it and it's a positive and a strength rather than being something that's sort of put in specifically to try and like mm. appeal to a certain type of person or to you know yeah like... i think there's some some probably basic places to start the first of which is gender is probably something that you start with that matches whatever you come out looking like but you are able to change it and one of the weird things about munchkin is that the thing that changes your gender other people do to you which I thought was particularly strange. Yeah. But being able to uh, have a character that represents a journey in approaching more masculine or approaching more feminine. Because in theory, you're born kind of an amorphous blob and approach mm. either end of the spectrum in some way, right? Yeah. Um, or end up in the middle somewhere or like slightly to left or whatever, right? Um, just kind of naturally. But now, through science, you're able to have more control over what that journey is 
And so um, to come back to the desolation of Jupiter, what might become a thing later on is that gender is much less important to people. And then someone goes, oh, actually, we um, there's been this huge calamity and our gender distribution has become a problem and we just need to pick a bunch of people to join the other side or whatever. Some like ridiculous thing like this where um, you are put in a situation where you can elect to change your physiology and able to suit a role for something where it's like you gaining a tool rather like you know what i mean like thinking about it in different contexts and how these things are used yeah. and what advantages you gain from that like, maybe the big challenge is like how to quantify mechanically like yeah if there's or, or negatives so i know that um when D D, like some of the first editions of D D, like if you were a woman you had more endurance or wisdom or something but if you were a man you had more strength and um something else and yeah there was like a big pushback against it it was like well that's kind of and there are like obviously like bell curves of yeah painting stereotype. based on stereotype and yeah so I, yeah yeah it's like do, do we want to return to that idea of sort of trying to assess what the strengths of different genders would be in in the context of the game mm. and um, making that part of mechanics or is it well, hang on. maybe evolving on that original concept, instead of having you're picking, like you're ticking one of the two boxes, male or female, right? Imagine you have masculine on one end and feminine on the other end. And the more points your character puts in a strength, they slide towards the masculine end. Or the more points they put into wisdom, they slide towards the feminine yeah, side. Maybe not saying right? women, saying masculine and feminine, and mm. the gender from, from that. Because yeah. you might go, well, I have all these points in in strength, but actually I wasn't planning on playing a masculine character. I'm gonna take these feats or take these other things that make me slide back towards where I want to be or whatever, right? And because when people yeah. are building characters for D and D, they're always kind of like, oh, and if I take this thing, that'll allow me to get this, which gives this option, and then I have a mm -hmm. thousand AC and all these. Other, and you're seeing how all the options slide together to build the character that you want when you could be doing the same thing about how that character is role playing or what how that character looks or is expressed or something like that as well. Yeah. And and this would be something that would be great to get yeah, like for people watching, like what's your perspective and have you seen good examples of, of where it's used and useful and important and where not. There was a there's a RPG called Thirsty Sword Lesbians. Big fan. Yeah. While ago. Big fan. Yeah. And that was like, okay, it's like what <laughs> But they, yeah, they're sort of partially like comedically, but yeah, I think there's some like valid points in there about um, you know, the mechanically the gender and sexuality of the players comes into it. Mm. And uh, there's also uh, what else was there? Yeah, um, oh, my my father Nelly and I are making this game about doing a generation shift. Where you're, you've got three generations before you get to like the planet, and you're trying to sort of almost be like like sort of social scientists and, and genetic engineers to an extent, to try and get ready for the planet that you're going to be encountering. Okay. Uh, and like shape the population across the generations mm. uh, before you get there, and the planet's like random each time, so it's sort of you know like, um, and there's a, a balance struck between. Um, you know, making sure that there are enough like birth givers and enough mm. providers, I guess. Is that like a, a DNA specific thing? They're like, oh, this planet is really, really hot. We want people with this specific trait that can handle such a climate. Yeah, and then you totally like true. encourage breeding between those specific people yeah, or something. Right. We absolutely avoid the issue of race, which is also like a mess. But like, mm. if you completely run out of people that can give birth, it's like well, the chip doesn't. Yeah, you yep. just don't hit generation three and <laughs> no one is piloting the ship. Yeah, yeah. And then <laughs> the quest. Yeah, and it is genetics. It's just like, you know, keep the system mm. um, really strong and stuff like that. And then those traits carry on to the next generation based on your like choices and also a little bit of random chart. Okay. Um, and there's also like equipment and, and you know, different people can make different things. So whether they're like genetically great or skill wise great. It's just a balance of your crew. Um and um yeah, but it's been 
it's been interesting trying to say because like obviously in that context like women are extremely important because if you don't have like specifically people that can give birth and um you know xx chromosomes then you're not gonna make it you're not gonna get there but if you then run out of the other it's like well then you can't do that either and so mm. um yeah maybe it's maybe it's just where there are opportunities to have the collaborative and complementary aspects of gender be represented in a game's design maybe it's cool to just put that in there and have it be part of it and not shy away. Um, and I, I bet there are sort of people that are much more expert in these areas that, mm. you know, either could make games or, or be the expert in a process of designing a game about this kind of thing. But Yeah, because yeah. I think a lot of the problem that we have um, is that everything is interpreted through a specifically human lens and specifically matches exactly the time period that we live in. So when you're talking about things that are set in the far future, things will have changed so drastically that a lot of the problems we face today won't exist. Stuff like the artificial womb might get to a point where no human being actually has to physically give birth and you're just donating genetic material and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, we might be relatively close to that as well. Yeah, like, like... in our lifetime, that could be a thing, which means that your whether or not you are a birth giver might become irrelevant. Yeah. And well, interestingly, <laughs> whether or not you want a masculine or feminine child. Yeah. And it becomes a choice rather than not. Yeah. And then yeah. how how you express your gender is just a part of your your physicality, how you look. Yeah. I think it's interesting, there are like medieval games and stuff where you go into, most of the time you just generate troops or whatever. You know, mm. But it might be interesting to have um, aspects where, you know, there's a bit of a balance between, at least mechanically in that way, you know, between the female and male population of your kingdom. Mm. You know, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Which would I be like interesting. Because, like, imagine that mathematically, right? You're like, okay... Let's say our our stronghold has a thousand citizens, um, and if you have a strict fifty fifty ratio, that means you have five hundred soldiers. And then if you send the women off to war with the soldiers, then that means that any casualties to the women means that your next generation of soldiers can only be so large or whatever. Yeah, that's right. But then we're sort of using women as a commodity to just generate more fight power, and that's right. that's right on it. Yeah. Yeah, maybe what we could do is um, yeah, just noodle away a little bit on that and sort of yeah, see what people say and like get some feedback and chat about it and yeah, spend you know ten minutes or so at the start of the next episode talking about it and going like what have we what have we learned <laughs> talking about yeah. designing games Tell yeah us. yeah yeah I think that'd be cool um, so yeah, I think it feels like a we've been chatting for about. 50, 55 minutes? Dead on. 49, 26. Great. Yeah. So I think we're right at this point where we're like, the perspectives and, we don't know, the conversation. I think we did cover a lot of stuff um, that we want to talk about, but the issue with um, gender in general, and I think a lot of people fall into this trap, is that having a conversation about it doesn't solve the problem. Having conversations about it helps you approach a place where you are better equipped to have conversations about it and are more understanding and accepting about how these things are happening. But if you're not having any or you're excluding yourself from the entire thing because you are shut off to it, then you just would never understand and would never grow and un- like come to a place where this becomes less of a problem, or at least that's how I understand it. Um, and so us doing this kind of thing and the beauty of a podcast is that the spectator is included in the conversation. Because in theory, the spectator at any time could have left, right? And the fact that you've watched the video this far, you've participated in this conversation, you may or may not have learned something about gender. At the least, you would have learned something about our particular lens that we see um, Mm. in how it exists. And maybe that helps you come to a different place. I don't know. That's kind of our point here. (laughs) 
Yeah, so I mean, like, please let us know what you think. Um, was there anything that we missed and left out? Are there perspectives or folks that would be good to view and talk to? Um, yeah, and just tell us what you think as well. Mm. Uh, Get in that so comment we, section. Yeah, what do you think we'll cover in the next one, Pete? Um, I don't know. It also um, depends if and when it is recorded. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to I keep things present. Dealing with fuck-ups while you're developing games, and particularly when you're crowdfunding games, and then, uh, you know, the economics of it all, you're like, oh, wait a second. <laughs> I did not. Yeah. That this level of funding would have this impact on this thing because, you know, and stuff like that. That might be interesting. To There's definitely some um, business type, like, running of the... Because to, to most people, the board game designer is that here's my idea, I'm done for the day. Uh, I assume that's what most people think we do. When the yeah. average indie designer does 10 people's jobs, um, yeah. like I do a lot of graphics design and I'm really not that great at it. Yeah. Um, this overlay I made, that's why it looks like shit. But this is a skill I've had to give myself so this could exist. <laughs> and the simplicity of it, I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Um, but yeah, maybe if you go into how to do all these things as well. If I could quickly plug something um, uh, through the Guildmaster YouTube channel um, with um, Jackson and, and Will and Stefan, who have been interning with me, um, I'm releasing a five video series on the steps of game design. So, or game production, sorry. So, like development, um, manufacturing, Funding, or crowdfunding, distribution, and ongoing sales and promotions. So, yeah, it would be cool um, also to get your perspective on those things. And how, yeah. If know, that's if that's in a, a YouTube playlist, I'll like, put the playlist link in the description as well. So um, people watching this can come and check out a lot of the other stuff that we're working on. Because that's the thing. When, when you're a creator in this particular job, you're not doing one thing. Um, I'm, I'm streaming. I'm shitposting on Twitter. I'm like... Doing all this other stuff at the same time, um, building the brand, you know, it's what you could call it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But you gotta gotta be on that grind set, right? Y'all seem to chill, and I think it'll be great to play some dark mode at some point. Yeah. Anyone watching? Um, it's definitely on my to do list. <laughs> we we literally put back recording an episode because Dark Tide came out. It's probably the <laughs> least grind set thing we've done. <laughs> I am, but yeah, so this is again the girl boss grind set, and I appreciate you guys coming out and having a listen and listening to the ramble. Um, we have taken a lot of feedback and we are trying to improve things. Like, for example, we've got a little bit better mic audio quality. Um, I didn't fiddle with my microphone the entire fucking episode like I did last time, so there's not going to be any of that kind of background noise and from my end i can hear that hannah is a bit clearer so we are trying to improve things and get it to a more steady state um but if you do have any other feedback about stuff that we can do and improve please let us know get in that comment section hit that like button because that is critical to algorithmic engagement in the youtube platform um the the first episode that we did was actually um, really successful compared to a lot of the other videos on my channel because people were getting in early and hitting that like button uh, and people were blowing up at us in the comments section. Um, so we do appreciate it. It does help a lot. Um, but yeah, I guess next time, hopefully next Friday, if we are together one time on time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the chaotic indie design work. Yeah. But looking forward to seeing you guys next time and thank you so much and thank you, Keith. It's been great. Yeah, next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>